These first few quilts are loaned to us by David Lee. He's a member of our Crossroads Arts Council, and he shared with us some quilts that were made by his great-grandmother, Emma Beale Huggins. Emma was born in 1894 in Davistown, Greene County, Pennsylvania. She was a housewife. She ran the farm most of her life. She had eight children, and so she had plenty of hands to help with all the chores, like collecting eggs and milking the cows and feeding the animals and growing the crops. She was a, the first gold star mother in Greene County and in Pennsylvania. For those of you who are not familiar with that term, a gold star mother is a, is a mom who's lost her son in battle. Her son, Wayne, was killed in World War II. She began quilting as her children started outgrowing their homemade clothes. She was an avid member of the Missouri Quilters through the Missouri State University Extension Program. And over the years, she became one of the program's most productive quilters, created numerous design patterns of her own. We're highlighting some of her quilts that she made from the beginning to the end. Her biggest legacy, says her great-grandson, besides the close-stitched family, has become the plethora of quilts. Many of her descendants have at least one. She produced quilts starting in the Depression in the 1930s and kept doing it until she passed away in 1979 at 84. Her existing quilts range from being at least 43 years old and some are at least 85 years old. This first one is called the Anniversary Rose. Emma made this quilt for her daughter Opal on her silver wedding anniversary. Opal and Charles Reeves romantically eloped in 1935. Charles asked Opal to marry him using a box of Hershey's Kisses. They drove across the state line from Pennsylvania to West Virginia to get married because they were both under 21. They celebrated their silver anniversary in 1962. This reflects a more modern design in Emma's quilt making, shadowing many of the quilting patterns that she saw through the extension membership. This next one, also done by Emma Beale Huggins, is called a pansy quilt. It's 47 years old. Emma was a master gardener. She has an established iris, which she bred and originally named Beale's Beauty, but in recent years it's been renamed Emma's Merlot. She grew gladiolas, dinner plate dahlias, zinnias, sunflowers, and many more to decorate her table. Her favorite flowers were the simple and elegant violas, the violet and the pansy. This is one of her original designs. They were made for many of her grandchildren. She made it in green or lavender or yellow trim. This one was, in particular was made for her great-grandson David Lee because of his passion for gardening like Grandma, great-grandma Emma's. It was in, made in 1975 and it was his college graduation gift. The next one by Emma is called the Red Triangles Quilt. As a quilting protege in Greene County, Emma made many quilts along with her colleagues in varying quilting clutches that she ran. Many earned grand prizes and she made some for businesses. Over the years, this design, Triangles Forever, became synonymous with Greene County, Pennsylvania. She made it in numerous colors. Post depression, it was made predominantly using leftover cotton scraps, whatever they could find. It was made for her grandson, David Lee, in 1973. The next one, Emma called Baby Doll Quilt. Where I was raised, we called this Sunbonnet Sioux, so you know that different places in the country call the same pattern different things. These squares are over 70 years old. The quilt is at least 50. While growing up, it was not uncommon on holidays and special days for our entire extended family to celebrate, including all the grandparents, all eight great-grandparents, and many assorted aunts and uncles, along with cousins. Both sides of my family knew each other rather well. Emma was my mom's grandmother, and this is speaking from David's standpoint. David's father's mom, Sophie, had two boys and then a third child, which she lost in a miscarriage. The child was a girl, and this tore Sophie's heart because she wanted a girl. Sophie spent her working life as a formal domestic for a wealthy family who owned department stores. She was influenced in many ways and groomed into a high-class lifestyle. 
When her employer's daughter saw how distraught that Sophie had become over the loss of her baby girl, she mentored Sophie and helped her find a cathartic way to overcome the loss of her baby girl. She channeled her into a positive way to get rid of her anguish. She brought material odds and ends from the store and worked along with Sophie to make these quilted baby doll blocks. The quilting process and the time with her friend Dorothy, who had also lost a child, helped Sophie through a very difficult time. The quilt was never completed. Later years, through getting to know each other, Emma then offered to complete this quilt for Sophie around the 1960s. The baby doll blocks were made by Sophie and Dorothy in the 40s, and the quilt was completed in the 60s. This one, also made by Emma, is 86 years old. It's called the Kids Star Quilt. While Emma's husband, Glad, ran the community general store, Emma ran the farm with the eight children. They all worked on the farm daily. The clothes she made for the kids in the early years were made from cotton feed sacks, which were bagged in calico fabrics for families to use. As the kids matured, their homemade clothes either became hand-me-downs for the younger children or they were retired to fabric swatches for future use. Many of the quilts were piecemealed, made from children's old clothing. So the fabric may be familiar not only to one child, usually to several, if not all eight. These were quilts that were made from each of the kids as they left home. The square outlines were usually made in the intended recipient's favorite color. In this case, it was for Opal because she liked yellow. It was given to Opal on her first wedding anniversary, February 14, 1936. This is definitely a reversible one. And we were noticing earlier that it doesn't seem like there's a seam at all in that back, which is unusual for that time period for a piece of material to be that wide. This next one is loaned to us by Anita Sandage. It was made by Olivia Elvenhoff, and it's called the Maple Leaf. It was made in 1980. This quilt was given to Tony Eldringhoff by his parents, Olivia and Andolf, when he married in May of 1980. The maple leaf pattern was a favorite of Olivia's as there were many maple trees on their farm. Adolf always knew when the quilt frame came out, dinner and supper were going to be quick and easy meals. Another note that was sent with this is they never missed their mid-afternoon break for a Danish and coffee. This one is loaned to us by Marty Rader. She considers herself very lucky because she found this in an antique shop down on the hill. There's nothing about it that tells who made it. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, you always need to label your quilts. Uh, so we don't know when it was made. But for those of you who are familiar with quilts, we kind of think this mirrors the Baltimore album quilts. Because remember, each of the blocks in a Baltimore album quilt are done differently, and they're all appliqued. This is sort of the same type of pattern, only it's cross-stitched. The next one is called the bow tie. It is loaned to us by Deborah Van Boeven. It was pieced by Hilda Van Boeven and was quilted by Hilda and her friends. It was hand pieced and quilted for Dan Van Boeven. His grandmother Hilda made it, pieced it sometime in the early 70s and quilted it with the friends from the Lady Sodality in Rhineland, Missouri. Hilda pinned a note on the back of the quilt that it was made for Daniel for his high school graduation gift. Hilda passed away in April of 1976, but luckily she had labeled it because he graduated in June of 1976, and so they knew that that was for him. The next one is loaned to us by Catherine Bray. She says, Pauline Bray was born on a small farm in Moscow Mills in the early 1900s. She grew up humbly, going to the feed store with her mother and sisters, choosing feed sacks to make into their dresses. She became an accomplished seamstress, making clothes for her children. In the 1940s, the family moved to the St. Louis area, where she worked at Sticks, Bear, and Fuller in the downtown St. Louis. 
Colleen continued to be an avid seamstress, now making clothes for her grandchildren. She also did quilting and crocheting. She made numerous quilted and crocheted blankets which were given to her children and then passed on to her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. When Pauline passed away, her children found their father's pool table covered with piles of fabric. Pauline would have been 113 this year. This quilt is loaned to us by Diane Knapp. It was made by Elizabeth Schwartz. She thinks in about the year 1981. Her grandmother made this for her for her 10th anniversary, and she's now been married 50 years. In the quilting world, the edge of this is what are called prairie points. That was something that when I moved to Missouri, it's the first time I had seen them, because I was born and raised in Iowa. We don't do prairie points in Iowa. But it's just an interesting, another way to finish the edge on a quilt. The next one is loaned to us by Margie Stratman. It was pieced and quilted by Anna Felkler Voss. It's called the 48 States Flowers. It's 60 years old, made in 1962. And Margie says, I remember ordering the pattern for the 48 State Flowers from the Globe Democrat newspaper. My grandmother Voss transferred on them onto the material for me. I didn't work on them very much because I was still in high school and I had a job at F.W. Woolworths. I only had about 20 minutes a week that I worked on them. My grandpa always went on a retreat to the White House and my I would spend that weekend with grandma. She called me and told me to bring the quilt blocks over and we'd work on it. I took them, but she pushed the box under the couch and then I forgot all about them. I had, I, the next week I called her and told her I'd forgotten the box. And she said, well, they're finished. It was about two or three weeks later, she not only had the quilt all pieced together, she had it quilted. However, at that point, we had 50 states. So she picked out a flower for Alaska and Hawaii and made pillow slips for them. If you notice rust spots on the blocks, those are the ones that I made back in the 60s. She made the sashing green because that was my favorite color. Grandma taught me how to embroider but she would make me take my stitches out if they were too big. <laughs> I remember that from my grandma. <laughs> this also is loaned to us by Margie Stratman. It was pieced and quilted by Anna Felker Voss. It was made in 1965. It's 57 years old. She said, I got this quilt from my grandma and grandpa Voss. It's blue, but I don't really like blue much. She made a quilt for each of the six grandkids. This quilt has a scalloped edge, and Grandma said she'd never do another one. And so since I was the first grandchild, I got that one. I didn't use it much because I didn't like blue, but now I'm glad that I didn't because it's in such good condition. One thing I want you to notice about this one and the next one as well is they don't have a bias edge on them like a lot of the quilts we do now. They just took the two edges from the top and the back and then turned them over and then stitched them together. And that's simply another way besides the prairie points and the bias that people have finished their quilts. This one also is loaned to us by Margie Stratman, again made by Annie Felker Voss. It's appliqued. It's 75 years old having been made in 1947. My brother let me go through my aunt's house and take whatever I wanted. I found this quilt and three more. This one was very badly stained, so I soaked it and washed it gently, and it came out beautifully. She probably didn't use it much because she didn't want to wear it out. She did that with a lot of things. She said, I know that she had jewelry that she didn't wear because she was afraid she'd lose it. The pattern in this is a log cabin. It's called You Are One of a Kind. It was quilted by Susan Fiello, and it's loaned to us by Cynthia Welch. And this is Cynthia's story. For a few years, I was enduring some painful circumstances with no relief in sight. I was an exhausted wreck. While sharing my troubles with my dear friend, she jumped up and said, I have something for you. I'll be right back. She returned with this gorgeous quilt that she had made. 
As she wrapped it around me, I cried with the comfort that it brought me and in gratitude for her kind generosity. I have no idea how many hours that she invested to create this. The tag says, this quilt is one of a kind, just like you. It was though I was the most beloved person in the world at that moment. Since then, this quilt has gone with me everywhere, as I have had to travel often. Sometimes I had temporary living arrangements, wrapping it up, sleeping under it, or just the sight of it helped me keep afloat. I could feel her love as though she were present. I will always treasure it and the peace that it brings. Those who quilt must have big hearts. My friend Susie is nothing less than a ministering angel. I believe every quilter sows love into every stitch. We are blessed to feel it for generations. This next one is loaned to us by Nancy Playford Jackson. It was made by Charlotte Peters. It's called the Floral Bouquet, made in 1970. Nancy says, this was my mother's first and only applique quilt. She applique, bound, and quilted it all by hand. I feel very lucky to have this cheerful quilt grace my bed. Mother was a second generation quilter. She passed this handcraft on to me, and now I have passed it on to my daughter, Meredith. And this a leech. She just moved out to Wentzville, and I met her because she came to St. Patrick's to quilt with us. And she was telling me about this quilt. I said, you have to loan it to us. So she didn't have time to write stuff, but she told me the story. So when her grandparent or her parents had an anniversary coming up, she wanted to do something special for, to them, for them. Two girls and six brothers. You ladies know how hard it is to get a needle in the hand of a guy, right? But every one of these blocks was done by her brothers or her sister or herself. This one has the corn and the chickens and the gardening because they always live on a farm and her mother, mother loved those things. One of the brothers lived in an A-frame out in the woods, so this is his block. This one is Elisa's because it has her children's name and her name and the numbers on the squares are their birth dates. She has one brother who had an excavating business. This one's his. One brother who was a plumber. This one, when I looked at it, I thought they were moonshiners, but she said, no, they're tapping maple syrup. Um, she corrected me quickly on that one. Um, the one on this side is a brother who loves gardening as much as his mom did, so he did all flowers. And it says 1982, so that was an anniversary gift from the kids to their parents. This next one is loaned to us by Karen Richter. It was pieced and quilted by Dorothy Engelmeyer. It's called The Lone Star. And Karen says, Dorothy made many quilts in her lifetime. She was a very busy farm wife. She gardened and she raised several, seven children. She never wasted a minute of her time. She made several Lone Star and Broken Star quilts for my sister and I. My husband and I used this quilt on our bed and eventually had many worn spots that I repaired in 2015. She did a good job because from a distance you can't tell where the repairs are. It's still sometimes used today and now I have learned to make quilts of my own for my family and Karen happens to have a quilt in our show. While we have this one up, since she repaired it, you can go ahead and fold it. Um, I'm going to tell you what another lady told me earlier today. She said when her mom made a quilt, she'd always put a pocket on the back and she would put some of the spare fabric in that pocket because then if it needed to be repaired, you had spare pieces of the fabric that the quilt was made of. And I thought, that's an excellent idea. This is another one that belongs to a friend of mine and I'll tell you its story. Belongs to Cleo Hamilton was made by her aunt Annie Muth. Annie would go to the store and buy embroidered blocks and buy material to make special quilts for her grandkids and she'd have all these in her cedar chest. Well when it was everybody's turn they got to go pick the one they wanted. When it was Cleo's turn she picked this and her grandma says Cleo you don't want that that's an everyday quilt. But Cleo was the youngest of all the granddaughters, and so she had worn all the clothes that got passed down from all the cousins, 
So she knows almost every fabric in here because it was a dress or a skirt that she wore. And so she wanted this everyday quilt because it had so many more memories for her than one of those fancy ones would have. This next one is loaned to us by Judy Ferguson. She says, 65 years ago, I arrived home from school and my mom asked if I would like to take a ride with her because she had a surprise for me. When I asked what it was, she said she had bought a raffle ticket for me for a quilt and I had won. And the winning quilt was this lovely red and white quilt. She said, I was very excited. I think it's the first time I ever won anything and I have treasured this quilt and the memory since then. The next six quilts have been shared with us by Kelly Barazzini. Four of them were created by her stepmother, Kathleen Carlson. Kathy was an avid cyclist. She became an enthusiastic rower of part of a team on Creve Coeur Lake. Her creativity included photography, violin, stained glass, countered cross stitch, as well as quilting. Many of her quilts were juried into the Circle in a Square quilt show in University City and to the Paducah quilt show, frequently winning ribbons. Her quilt titled, We're in a Pickle, features themes of recycle, reuse, and repurpose, was published in Karen Patterson's, Karen Patterson Bresnahan's book called 500 Traditional Quilts. She also made many quilts which she donated to fundraising for Alzheimer's research. Though Kathy passed away far too early in her life, she generously gifted much of her artwork to her family and her friends before passing away in 2015. This first little one says Kathy Carlson was my... Kelly says, Kathy Carlson was my stepmom. This was one of the many quilts that were layered on her guest bed. We went through them many times and distributed them to her loved ones. This one hangs in my dining room. And to tell you how small the circle is, there was a lady here this afternoon at 3 o'clock who when she heard that name, she goes, I think she used to be one of my neighbors. And I remember seeing that pink quilt on her wall. So... If you hang in with quilters, you're going to find them every place. <laughs> this next one is called the South Dakota Star. It says um, this was made for Kathleen's dad, who has deep roots in South Dakota. It was always on his couch for him to use, but I don't think he ever did. Since I've had it, this patriotic piece has been folded in my grandchildren's bedroom. I was upset when I opened it and noticed it was damaged. It needs some TLC for repair. Look at the back of this one. It's just as pretty on the back as it is on the front. The next one is called Whirligig. This was always kept at the foot of my dad and Katie's bed. I now have it on display in a day bed in my grandchildren's bedroom. This next one is called Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend. It's another quilt that was layered on the guest bed at Kathleen's. It had never been used. It's always on my bed. I love it and appreciate it every day. Kelly says, this one's called a crazy quilt. I have no idea who made it. Just another reason why all of you need to put labels on your quilts, because we can't give anybody credit for this. She found it at a garage sale. It's deteriorating it, but she said it's still interesting and fun because the colors are so unique. And if you look closely, the pieces that have disintegrated are the fancy fabrics, like the satins and the damasks and the, and the um, sateens. All the cottons are in good shape yet. That's why we still use cotton. (laughs) 
This one is called a gold scalloped quilt. It was hand embroidered in 1978 by my mother-in-law, Elizabeth Helm. It was her very first quilt. She had her friend do the quilting after they pieced the blocks together. It was given to Kelly at her wedding shower and it's been used on her bed for years. So that concludes our bed turning. Just a couple things um, that I want to tell you. One is if you look at the back of your program, those are all of the people who have given us money to make sure that we could have this quilt for the enjoyment of the community. One change that we made this year, in the last five or six years we've been doing this, we've usually only awarded a $50 prize to the top quilt in each category. But because of our generous sponsors this year, we've been able to change that so that the first place in each category gets $75, second place gets $50, and third place gets $25. I know it doesn't come near touching what they put into the quilt, but it might at least pay for the thread. Um, so if they are, those are local businesses that you can um, patronize, that's wonderful because they help us make this happen.